we just wait for another 15, 20 seconds to make sure all the attendees are with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Avinash Paliwal. I am the Deputy Director of the SOAS South Asia Institute, and I would like to welcome you all this afternoon to the third webinar in the series of uh, webinars on South Asia that we are hosting this term on India-Pakistan relations, retrospect and prospect. Having covered some ground on the domestic politics of Pakistan and the political economy of Bangladesh, uh, in this session, the idea is to really kind of look at some of the most enduring challenges, geopolitical challenges that South Asia faces. And one, one of which, of course, is this continuously tormented relationship between India and Pakistan, which always keeps its followers quite busy and quite hectic, as we have seen in the past one week, where there is increased firing at the line of control. There are allegations and counter allegations from both the sides, but there's no visible uh, outlet or at least an emerging outlet for a conversation between the two sides. To discuss this bilateral relationship, its immediate and longer history, but also where it is really headed, we have two really distinguished speakers with us today. And for anyone who's following South Asian geopolitics, none of them actually requires an introduction, but I would be honored to introduce both of them. Uh, Dr. Happyman Jacob, is an associate professor of diplomacy and disarmament at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. He's a columnist with Hindu and hosts a weekly show on national security at thewire.in. He's also a celebrated author of two recent books which he authored on, on the dynamics of the line of control called The Line of Control and Line on Fire. Highly recommended. Uh, our second speaker, of course, is Dr. Aisha Siddika. She is a research associate at the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy right here at SOAS, a PhD in war studies from King's College London, and an author of, of two books on Pakistan's security, military, Pakistan's arms procurement and military buildup. There, is, there are very few fruitful conversations that can be had about Pakistan's civil military relationship without referring to or without acknowledging uh, the insights, the deep insights that Aisha has offered to all of us uh, especially on her on the military economy and the mill bus of Pakistan. Uh, without further ado, I would now request our first speaker who will speak for about 15 minutes, Dr. Aisha Siddika, to kind of lay out her thesis, following which I'll request uh, Dr. Jacob to come in. Uh, once they have given their, their, their pitch, once they have made their presentations, we will open up the floor for questions. And at that point, you can feel free to either speak up, raise your hand, or you can put your questions in the questions and answer chat box at, at the bottom of this page. But on that note, Aisha, the floor is all yours. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Avinash. Um, thank you, uh, Avinash Palival, and thank you, South Asia Institute of SOAS for uh, holding this conversation on a, uh, on a topic which is not fashionable at the moment. Um, I mean, nobody talks about India, Pakistan, peace. Uh, at this point in time, everybody's busy doing something else. But definitely, there is not the environment or mood at this point in time to talk about India, Pakistan relations uh, or peace, definitely not. But let me very quickly then move on to say that uh, why is, I mean, Pakistan and India used to talk. We were, I mean, I'm definitely the generation which is used to uh, seeing a conflict being talked about. There would be these spurts of uh, anger and violence, and then you'd suddenly have those troughs or uh, valleys where there would be peace that come together. And, and we've, we've, we've seen India, Pakistan talk to each other. But what is it that makes today different? Today, and let me tell you, today I feel is different. It's not the 80s, it's not the 90s. I mean, I remember 1980s. Uh, the entire 1980s, it was either military exercises which created tension. There was, um, you know, the, the Sikh insurgency in, in, in um, 
in, in Punjab, in India's Punjab. Uh, you know, there was Siachen that happened then. So there was a lot of activity and yet there was conversation. Now there isn't conversation and why it, we're having uh, an issue with conversation. I think there are four fundamental changes that have, they're taking place. Two are domestic, two pertain to, uh, you know, uh, the domestic environment and two to uh, political and uh, geopolitical. And let me state them uh, both. Um, now, the two domestic issues, which I think are critical, is that India and Pakistan are both changing. Uh, Pak India is, has, is shifting from a secular India to a very religion, religious identity based, a Hindutva based India. Uh, Pakistan had never dealt with this India before. Uh, we would talk about uh, a Hindu India, but never a Hindutva India. So Pakistan is not used to that. And it's, it's, it's a very critical change that, that has come in. in, in many ways, which is inspiring a lot of Pak Islamic nationalism. Uh, it's not Islamism, uh, it's a different uh, Pak Islamic Islamism. Uh, it's, it's a category in its own, and I can talk about it in, in Q&A. Uh, so it's invoking this a different kind of a religious nationalism on both ends, which then uh, kind of superimposes and it, 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 it strengthens the, the, the historical, historic phenomena of the two nation, uh, of, of two nation theory. In fact, if generations of Pakistanis were not con convinced that there was something like a two nation theory or that it was something, I mean, I've heard arguments while growing up that no, 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 two nation theory actually, uh, people have lived together and, and, and uh, people have communicated. Yet now this two nation theory is making a lot of sense. Uh, it is convincing a lot of people. Uh, you can't walk beyond that at the moment. Uh, I cannot, uh, many others cannot, it's there. Culturally, what is happening, which is the second domestic uh, shift that I'm talking about, that for, for Pakistan, Pakistan and India were kind of, despite the conflict, they were culturally connected as well. I mean, India and Pakistan make for a very interesting case study where Culture has not, a common culture has not helped them traverse the conflict and the divide. It has, uh, the cultural, the conflict has happened despite the cultural connection. And yet, what we've also seen that now, uh, what I think makes it a uh, very uh, kind of tedious, highly problematic is that now there is that a cultural disconnect is very slowly happening. Uh, in, in on Pakistan side, there is, uh, you know, there is Turkey, Turkish dramas, which are which are happening, Turkish music. I mean, we 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 are the we are the people who would sing and dance to. Uh, I mean, I've had uh, I've heard instances where military men uh, getting married, uh, fighting on borders, would come back, uh, you know, attend their weddings and dance to uh, Bollywood music being played. Uh, so that could happen now. Pakistan is searching for, uh, slowly searching for a new identity, a much more Islamic identity, a more kind of European liberal uh, Islamic tradition of sorts. Uh, and, and, and therefore, I think for me, that is something to look at very carefully. Uh, that, that, that disconnection means that it, it's going to kind of further uh, thaw, uh, uh, sorry, further uh, reduce possibility of what we are talking about. We can sit, still go to the to conversation and have conversation, but what? The question is what? Now, geopolitically, two important shifts have happened. Uh, and, and this cultural and political, domestic political feeds into it. Uh, so geopolitically, the one major shift which has happened is uh, Article 370, India's change of, of the status of Kashmir. It's a huge one. Uh, now, maybe from time to time, we know that historically India and Pakistan have come together, tried to have a conversation on Kashmir, try to solve it. I mean, from Tashkent to Shimla to, uh, uh, you know, to Lahore Declaration, there have been uh, times when 
governments have thought about, all right, let's talk trade first, Kashmir later, try to solve Kashmir through trade and, and, and other ways of, of communication, have a comprehensive dialogue, or, you know, Shimla and Tash can talk about Kashmir itself. But here's a situation when Kashmir, in a way, uh, from India's perspective, has been the issue, has been uh, put to rest. Um, on, on Pakistan's side, uh, it has come as, a, of course, as a surprise, but it's taken, almost taken an initiative away. And it's, and, and it strikes at the existential issue of Pakistan. Uh, uh, Pakistan's existence as a Muslim state uh, in South Asia has been so dependent on Kashmir. And this is despite that in Pakistan's part of Kashmir, uh, the changes that we see in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in India now with 370 and all has happened in a different style in, for example, Gilgit Baltistan. Uh, in case of Gilgit Baltistan, I can talk about it more during Q and A and how you know how Pakistan did it, but anyway, it has struck at at at, at a very significant chord. Kashmir is a major. Uh, the change in Kashmir is is major. The second shift that is taking place is the power arrangement, the geopolitical global geopolitical power arrangement in the form of uh, you know the in the the, the Indo Pacific uh, strategy. Uh, of, of the US and, and Europe and how it connects with, with South Asia. Now, uh, there is China, which is, uh, you know, which is China, Pakistan and China have had, had traditionally, uh, they've had relations since I would say 1955. Uh, and um, now, despite that, it's, it's like putting Pakistan in a box. Pakistan doesn't want to be in a box yet. It has to be in a box. Uh, and there is and 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 there is this larger indo uh, sorry uh, us china conflict which will kind of uh, draw in both uh, india and pakistan uh, you know in a, in a in a fundamental way and what impact does it have this is something which is much larger which is much bigger and it's going to have impact on how we uh, perceive each other and how we have a conversation now with all these changes happening, I think the possibility of uh, conflict is much higher. And conflict is not just going to war. I mean, the possibility where we are kind of inches away. I mean, we have a new uh, environment in which uh, Delhi seems to be much more uh, eager or much more uh, forthcoming in, in, in striking back when, when, when there is any uh, you know, uh, when, when, whenever there is action from, from Pakistan's side of the divide, uh, be it militants or, or be the military, we see the increase in tension on the LOC, uh, all of that is happening. Now, there is that factor. And then, um, you know, uh, there is, so conflict has increased, but also the war of narratives has exacerbated. Uh, what we see uh, recently, you know, uh, Pakistan, um, uh, the DGISI and, and uh, so, sorry, DGISPR, Inter-Service Public Relations, and the foreign minister gave a press conference in which they talked about a dossier, dossier containing evidence, what Pakistan considers evidence of India's involvement in, 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 uh, in breeding uh, terrorism in, 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 in Pakistan. Now that dossier is basically, uh, you know, whatever the details may be there and whatever the meat may be in the in a dossier. But here is evidence of a Pakistan ready to fight a war of narratives, which it it had never done before. Uh, it's ready to do that. It's ready to go out into the world and say, look, you think I'm bad. I'm not the only one bad in this region. There is India as well doing similar thing. Uh, so both countries are ready for conflict, some form of conflict, be it through uh, words and or, or be it through guns. Where is talk? Where is conversation and all of that? Uh, sadly, uh, and interestingly, this is not even a time when you have a fruitful track to or a back channel uh, dialogue. And what we saw again very recently through um, this famous uh, or notorious, whatever term you may use for it, 
uh, interview uh, of uh, Pakistan Special Assistant to Prime Minister on National Security, Moeed Yusuf, his interview with Karan Thapar, uh, very clearly the message that came out was Pakistan is not interested in talk. Um, I mean, I would, I would really want to engage Happy Mon in, in that conversation. Uh, he, he probably may know more than I do, because it seems that some kind of tiny conversation was happening like a background music somewhere. Um, you know, was it with the Americans? Was it independently India and Pakistan? But what SAPM or national security did was scuttle any possibility that there, there could be uh, for a conversation. How do we get onto a conversation? India and Pakistan are neighbors. You can't, you can't get away from that reality. How do you get back to the table? Uh, and the question I think I would want to ask is, myself and 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 others on uh, here um, uh, happy mon and and you know i hope we can have this conversation is how do you start a conversation is track to the way is the track to that we've had traditionally the way i mean these track tools uh, for whatever they're worth have not actually brought in anything meaningful we have people who have sat on track tools may have learned a bit more about how the other side felt but then how do you move from point A to B? Forget about point A to Z. How do you move from point A to B? Um, There's so many issues that, that are happening. Um, is, it, is, it, is it ever possible to think about getting well-meaning people from both sides together on a table, you know, maybe through Zoom or some, something? Uh, have them talk about what are the doables? take responsibility for, uh, you know, for, for peace. Uh, what we've seen in track two is that those actors who were involved in track two would never kind of utter a word despite that they were not part of track one. Uh, they have behaved like track one when the need arose. So how do you kind of move on from there? Um, uh, so, so I, th I think essentially I would have learned a lot today if we could have a discussion and, and figure out uh, that in this environment where conversation has seems difficult, how do you start a conversation? Uh, we are stakeholders. We are stakeholders in a joint future, even that may, it may be disjointed. Uh, Pakistan and India have had, you know, historically from 1948 onwards, Pakistan and India have had 10 agreements. Shimla, Tashkent, Liaquat Nehru uh, agreement, then you have had non-nuclear uh, agreement of uh, 1988, several. Then the latest being Kartarpur agreement. Yet, uh, should we be just satisfied and happy and sit back and say, all right, the times when we, when, when peace returns, when conversation returns to the table, we can have agreements. This is not the time. The question is, how do you then, with these structural changes taking place in South Asia, how do you get back to the table? Is it even worth it? And if it's worth it, then how should we carry it forward? I shall thank you so much for such a comprehensive sort of uh, outlay of, of the contemporary history and the issues that are really kind of defining this relationship, both at a domestic level uh, in Pakistan and India, but also the geopolitics of it. Happy, there's a lot of uh, food for thought here, especially also as, as Aisha kind of, you know, very importantly mentioned the role of various platforms and which platform may or may not work. But I don't want that, I mean, the floor is all yours. We'll, we can come back to the issue of track two and various other processes and platforms, you know, and their efficacy. But for now, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Avinash. Um, I'm, I'm really very grateful to the uh, SOA South Asia Institute and uh, uh, Avinash yourself for uh, this very kind in, uh, invitation. Uh, I'm also thankful to you for the uh, very generous uh, introduction that uh, you gave. Um, I, I must say I'm honored to be on the uh, panel with Dr. Aisha Siddiqui, who I consider to be uh, one of the best analysts of our region, one of the finest minds um, in our region on 
um, geopolitics and on, on India-Pakistan relations in particular. Aisha actually gave us a very uh, historically balanced and informed big picture. So I'm going to focus more on the um, sort of contemporary state of affairs. Um, and again, as um, she sort of drawn this picture, I think this is probably one of the lowest points in India-Pakistan relations, and it's, it's, it's sort of increasingly getting worse as days pass. Um, what started in um, 2019, August, in some ways, is, is sort of still playing out. And I think this will continue to shape um, India-Pakistan relations for the foreseeable future. Um, much, of, uh, the, uh, much of 2020 uh, was spent by the two countries uh, in name-calling uh, each other. Uh, and as again, as I just pointed out, there has been very little contact bilaterally, uh, nor is there any appetite, in fact, um, for any contact bilaterally. There are no high commissioners uh, in each other's countries. Uh, there is no formal uh, dialogue process going on uh, between the two sides, uh, mind you, between two nuclear uh, capable countries. There are absolutely no dialogue happening. Uh, no high commissioners and no back channel dialogue uh, since 2014, um, since, since the time uh, BJP government came to power in Delhi, we have not had any back channel contacts with the Pakistani side, ma barring a few instances of um, uh, some, some conversations. Um, and Pakistan has also upped the ante by releasing a new map um, of Pakistan and, uh, and now currently um, accusing India of carrying out terror attacks within, within, within Pakistan. Um, and as far as Kashmir is concerned, uh, there seems to be little appetite in Delhi to reach out to the aggrieved Kashmiris uh, on the one hand. Uh, and as I said, Pakistan has upped the anti in Kashmir, and I have in front of me the data um, on ceasefire violations, on terror infiltrations, on terror attacks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just to give you a sense of what I'm trying to say, in the year 2011, we had just 62 ceasefire violations. In the year 2014, we had 583 violations. And in this year, until October 23, uh, we have had 3,800 violations. Um, just to clarify, what is a ceasefire violation? It's a, a ceasefire violation is um, what happens within a 24 hour period in a 40 to 70 kilometer um, area. Uh, between the two sides. It could be hundreds of thousands of shots by any kind of weapon. So that's what we are talking about. So into uh, 3,800, that's the data for this year. Um, Kashmir, in many ways, is the mother of all India-Pakistan conflicts. So let me focus on Kashmir for a minute before I uh, uh, go forward. Is there, de does Delhi have a theory of victory or an endgame in Kashmir? Uh, if yes, what does it look like? Um, now, before I sort of explain if there is a theory of victory or not, let me also make it very clear that I, I think the uh, 2019 August decision, which meant two things, withdrawing the special status that was given to Kashmir traditionally, and um, dividing the uh, state of Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories and bringing them under the Indian Union government. Uh, I think this is a domestic Indian decision, a contested one. And that's something that many of us in India deeply disagree with. But I am not so sure that uh, Pakistan really has a locus standi on this particular issue. Um, and I, I'm, I'm happy to go through each part of the decision, uh, should there be any question during the question and answer session. But let me, let me sort of very briefly try and uh, address what I think are the Indian strategies in Kashmir at this point of time. Uh, uh, number one, I think uh, there is a um, active um, um, you know, attempt in the, uh, on the Indian side to sideline the moderate separatists and mainstream politicians in Kashmir. And we've seen tweets by various Indian ministers and the actions of the Indian state. And secondly, I think there is an attempt at creating new political formations uh, and political narratives in, in Kashmir. This is for the, for the government of India, a battle of narratives. So you, you've seen the mushrooming of parties like the Apni party in Jammu and Kashmir to sort of create a new narrative and formation within Jammu and Kashmir. And the third, uh, I think, strategy is to sort of shift the focus uh, um, from Kashmir to the, what, 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 is, what, what is called in India, the Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Uh, so the focus is on that. So government, government of India says, if we have to talk about Kashmir, we will talk about Pakistan occupied Kashmir and not on the Indian Kashmir. Uh, and there is, of course, a slow withdrawal of restrictions as far as uh, 
uh, Kashmir is concerned of uh, the releasing of political prisoners or reinstating internet access, etc. Um, and what these strategies, uh, what, what, so what, what, what can this, if I, may, if I may sort of characterize these strategies, I would say that these are clearly, clearly unilateral strategies uh, from the Indian side. They certainly do not take on board the popular Kashmiri demands. Uh, and, and definitely not Pakistani sensitivities on the Kashmir question. Uh, New Delhi's vision for Kashmir uh, at this point of time seems to be a short-term one to contain violence and manage the narrative within, within Kashmir and on Kashmir. Uh, to that extent, therefore, this is a non-conciliatory and winner-takes-all theory of victory, which I think would have long-term strategic implications. Um, there is absolutely no grand strategic plan to pacify Kashmiri sensitivities. Um, uh, more uh, so uh, to less, uh, more, more more so um, to settle the Kashmir conflict in general. Now, let me sort of try and turn uh, my attention towards what I think are the Pakistani strategies in Kashmir. Um, I think uh, it's become very obvious in the recent past that. Um, Pakistan wants to Kashmir shame India in various international forums and coordinate condemnation of India in internationally, right? I mean, it has not really met with much success, but there is a lot of coordination happening with, with, with Malaysia, Turkey, China, Iran, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it, I would say this has not really met with much success. The important that I think the most dangerous uh, part, part of the strategy is really casting doubt on the Shimla agreement. Uh, retired Pakistani officials um, close to the establishment they have in the recent past made the argument that the Indian decision in August 29 um, has basically uh, nullified the Shimla agreement of 1972, which actually forms the basis of India-Pakistan bilateral relations, including the management of uh, the line of control in Kashmir, uh, that it is no more valid. To my mind, this certainly has definite and long-term uh, strategic implications. Uh, clearly, the Pakistani strategy also in, uh, involves increasing the heat uh, in Kashmir. Um, um, that means clearly aiding and abetting infiltration across the line of control and coordination among various terror groups within the uh, Kashmir Valley. Um, now, if you look at these two uh, sets of strategies, what you see is that you are, uh, the two sides are adopting uh, zero-sum uh, positions, uh, which I think is clearly unsustainable in the longer run. Um, the situation in, uh, uh, in, in Kashmir may actually become too hot to handle for the Indian government when the restrictions, when the double lockdown, as it were, the Kashmir lockdown and the COVID lockdown sort of get lifted increasingly. Uh, and they might, ha they, they will have to happen, of course, um, at some point of time. Let me also very quickly um, sort of try and uh, um, focus a little bit on the potential for escalation uh, between the two sides. Um, you have had a number of terror attacks in the recent past and even before uh, uh, 2019 uh, August. But the Indian response to these uh, terror attacks in Kashmir have been, uh, has been, I would say, muted. Um, that's, of course, because these are small scale attacks on the one hand and have not really enjoyed high visibility. So uh, logically, therefore, in my opinion, if the intensity of these attacks and the visibility of these attacks were to increase, uh, I would say Balakot uh, like strikes cannot be ruled out. Uh, why do I say that? Um, for two reasons. One, I think uh, the lesson learned by the Indian decision makers in some, in some sense from the Balakot episode of early 29 uh, seems to be that uh, thanks to its superiority in conventional weaponry, India can carry out um, limited military, conventional military strikes against Pakistan, even across the international border without provoking perhaps a tactical nuclear response from Pakistan. Um, now, on the other hand, Pakistan seems to be uh, emboldened by the LOC, LAC standoff with the, with, in, between India and China, right? I mean, um, the, the, the Pakistani perception about this seems to be that China has put India in its place um, on the line of actual control. Uh, and it might actually provide a lot more confidence to Pakistan to increase the heat uh, on India in, 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 in Kashmir. Um, the problem is this, uh, Modi's loss of face on the line of actual control. Um, domestically, because Modi said nothing has happened with the line of actual control, which a lot of people do not believe. 
may actually force him to uh, take radical steps vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan should Pakistan try something uh, drastic and high visibility um, on the line of control. So I think there is a um, real issue when it comes to escalation because the lesson learned in uh, Balakot is uh, that we can do it and get away with that. And secondly, the loss of face on the China front may, may actually prompt Mr. Modi and the BJP government to take more forceful steps on the line of, uh, line of control. So what next for India-Pakistan relations? Uh, I think um, uh, Kashmir will come in the way of any potential India-Pakistan conversation. As I point, uh, pointed out earlier, from the Pakistani point, point of view, uh, discussing Kashmir is an absolute must. Uh, for India, uh, Kashmir is not on the agenda for any potential conversation with Pakistan, one due to domestic political reasons and, and, and perhaps uh, also due to the sunk cause. But too much has been invested uh, by the BJP government uh, vis a vis Kashmir, and it will be difficult for them to go back on that. Uh, and secondly, the government of India also, from, an, from, a, from a sort of larger institutional point of view, believes that past attempts at creating peace in Kashmir really haven't really provided any dividends, and therefore there's no point in uh, talking to uh, Pakistan on the Kashmir question. Um, so I think because Kashmir is the mother of all India-Pakistan conflicts, um, the, the, the potential step will have to be taken uh, on, on Kashmir by the Indian side, uh, or both India and Pakistan. The question is, will that happen? Um, well, one way to perhaps go about um, uh, this is to sort of uh, try and return the statehood to Jammu and Kashmir, which may, uh, which may alleviate some pressure uh, from the local Kashmiris, which could also potentially prompt the Pakistanis to sort of reach out to uh, the Indian side through the back channel and say, all right, now you have, you have returned statehood to Kashmir, you have brought about a certain amount of uh, enormous to Kashmir, um, and we can perhaps think of revisiting the Musharraf Manmohan formula uh, in, uh, in some shape or form uh, through the back channel. This is perhaps the only, in my opinion, way forward. Is it easy to uh, get to that stage? I don't think it is easy to, easy to get, get to that stage, simply because there is absolutely no um, appetite as it were. But before I end, I sort of want to say um, that this is not only the uh, not only one of the lowest moments in India-Pakistan relations, uh, but also importantly, India-Pakistan relations have reached a crossroads of sorts for a number of reasons. Um, the appetite for improving bilateral relationship is very little to non-existence, uh, non-existent, non-existent. Uh, while Pakistan seems to be grouping with. China, Russia, and perhaps countries like Iran and Turkey, as Aisha pointed out, from a larger, broader strategic point perspective, India is going towards um, uh, further towards the United States and Western powers. So they are they are sort of um, in many ways in the opposing op 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 opposing camps, to put it very loosely. We do not know how the new administration in Washington D.C. will approach the situation in the region, but one thing is for sure. U.S. is unlikely to push India on talks with Pakistan or on Kashmir or on the human rights issue, certainly not publicly, given D.C.'s stakes vis-a-vis -vis China and how D.C. sees India's role vis-a-vis -vis China in the region. So from a uh, broad international structural point of view, what we are witnessing is a major shift uh, wherein two distinct worldviews and camps are getting solidified. And this will impact how conflict resolution takes place in the region. The growing cultural disconnect uh, that, that Aisha pointed out uh, is also very, very significant in this context. This will further skew the um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, space that we have in India uh, towards a reconciliation with Pakistan and the space that Pakistan has within Pakistan, within the civil society of Pakistan, uh, for um, uh, building peace with India. Um, also, the, the Pakistani allegations, recent allegations about India carrying out terror attacks against Pakistan or funding terror attacks against Pakistan, I think, uh, uh, you know, they have not really gone down well in Delhi, and this will be a bigger stumbling block in the, in the days to come. And one doesn't know the sense of triumphalism in Pakistan about the Afghan question. Uh, and, and, and the return of uh, Taliban to Kabul in what, some shape or form, how that will impact 
um, its own its own view of uh, uh, regional politics, as it were. So um, and I'll conclude with this one uh, one one statement, uh, Avinash. So in my opinion, uh, this means the following: um, um, international uh, pressure um, to talk in general um, on Kashmir or terrorism or bilaterally in general. I think could will be fended off pretty easily by both India and Pakistan, um, uh, and the pressure is going, not going to be that much. In any case, the United States and the and and the West's ability to influence, mediate, shape um, the bilateral conversation is uh, drastically decreasing today. Uh, Washington D.C.'s ability to mediate during a crisis, should there be a crisis. Uh, between the two sides um, uh, would be much less compared to uh, the previous crisis, um, say for, uh, the, the, the Kargil crisis, for example. Um, so this could also mean, therefore, if there is no pressure or uh, uh, ability to mediate from the international uh, uh, community side, this could also potentially lead to more risk-taking uh, tendencies um, on either side. Uh, and uh, the potential for accidental escalation, etc. Um, I know I'm not. This is this is certainly not a rosy picture. Uh, but I just wanted to put these facts on the table as I see them. Uh, I'm happy to sort of um, um, take any any questions. Thank you so much, Avinash. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it really kind of you know brings to to call for the the central issues that are that are. Uh, that remain salient to both the countries. And as you said, Kashmir is the mother of all issues here that we are talking about. And of course, historically, we have seen both countries have very different perceptions about the issue and very different, radically different strategies. And you mentioned India and Pakistan are at crossroads, uh, but they are in opposing camps. It kind of really kind of, you know, put the Cold War scenarios also to some extent in, in front of me, where there is a history of India and Pakistan actually navigating through global shifts without actually changing what is central to their interests, right? During the Cold War, India was talking to the Soviet Union, even if there was a whole idea of non-alignment, which was, which was influential in India's policy thought. Uh, Whereas you, Pakistan had taken a very clear alliance, you know, with, with, with the West, with the United States. In many ways, we can see that these regional, this, this rivalry, India-Pakistan rivalry, has actually uh, endured all these geopolitical shifts, whether it is the Cold War, whether it's the 1990s unilateral moment of power, you know, global power for the United States, the so-called global war on terror post-2001, and over the past five years, this resurgence of nationalism and this, you know, the so-called new Cold War 2.0, as some are calling it, between China and its regional and global adversaries. Both of you have given a lot uh, really to kind of unpack here, both on, from a domestic perspective and from a geopolitical, regional and international perspective. Before we open the session, before, we, uh, before I request our audiences to kind of, you know, bring in the questions and comments. And I can see already in the Q&A uh, box, there are already questions and comments. One quick points, one quick questions to both of you, Aisha and, and Happy Men, and you can take it in conjunction with, with other questions. We can have more than one question at a time. What is it if tomorrow the leaderships of these countries decide that this is unsustainable, as both of you have underlined, that given the situation between India and China, New Delhi realizes it cannot fight uh, or even comprehend in earnest a two and a half front conflict as is common to debate in Delhi. That there is some pacification of you know, relationships that needs to happen either with China or with Pakistan. And it thinks that Pakistan is more doable than China given the, given the intensity, the global intensity of the Sino-Indian uh, rivalry. How is it that the leadership, especially a BJP leadership, which has banked so much on the rhetoric and the practices espoused within the rubric of Hindutva, Hindu nationalism, wherein you know, there is very kind of partisan communal flavors to its electoral logics, to its kind of mass appeal in India. How does it go to its core constituencies and explain to them and kind of seek their support to actually have that kind of a conversation? Because Aisha mentioned this cultural disconnect that is happening between the two countries. I, you, I agree with you, Happyman, that back channel perhaps is the only way. The Manmohan Musharraf back channel is perhaps the only way. But to my mind, that's only the first step. 
that is not the end point. For an end point of this relationship to stabilize, we need to have a larger conversation between the publics of India and Pakistan. Uh, how does BJP build on a particular kind of back channel if let's assume it takes place? And Aisha, similarly in the case of Pakistan, uh, we have known through your scholarship and various other kind of works that we have read, there is a very abiding interest in ensuring, you know, this whole idea of Pakistani identity and the centrality of Kashmir in there. How is it that Pakistan tomorrow would go and convince its own constituencies, you know, whoever the military leadership sees as, as its constituents, whether it's the core commanders, whether it's their own military rank and file, whether it's the larger public, how do they convince them that whatever conversation they're having with India is actually, uh, you know, may or may not lead towards peace? You know, how do, they, how do they shape their own public perceptions? In one way, I would say, given mass communication and given the kind of social media communication and various kind of uh, this, this technological revolution, it might be easier for them to put their narratives this, in this war of narratives. But can they really convince people to come together and actually solve these issues if and when they wanted to? Or do you think that ship has sailed and now it's too late? I'll keep, I, I, will, I will now also open the floor for, for any questions. To all of you who are there, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. We have a couple of, we have actually quite a few questions now coming up in the Q&A. Uh, box, but if you want to speak up, please raise your hands. I'll be happy to invite you to speak up your question, to articulate it. But if you write it down, I'll introduce your name and I'll spell out the question to Aisha and Happyman. Uh, so, so Aisha, okay, let's let's start with these, these points. The domestic politics of India-Pakistan relations. And do you think anything, you know, they can move ahead uh, fruitfully, even if there is a back channel in the making? draw your attention towards, uh, which is that there is a structural shift much bigger than what we saw in the past. Now, for the back channel to start, the back channel has to start on the basis of some interest amongst the people uh, and an argument or a narrative uh, out in the public that there is actually a benefit from India-Pakistan conversation. What I'm trying to say is that that conversation in itself, that, you know, let's meet. We've not known each other. We've fought each other for so long, but let's meet. Let's test each other. Let's see where we can, uh, you know, narrow the, uh, the, the divide. Now that interest seems to be receding. It's almost not there. Uh, India is, it's talked about, it brings out Pakistani nationalism, yet it's not the main interest. Uh, you know, in the past and where the boat seems to have sailed away is that in the past, you've had a political system where politicians could bring, bring back. I mean, I think the last high point was when Nawaz Sharif was, was Pakistan's prime minister and he started off with, uh, his his he's he actually started off his third tenure by talking about I'm I want to have trade with India. Uh, and and this is a conversation and he what he was doing he was adding on to the conversation that had gone on between Manmohan Singh and Musharraf. Uh, I mean let's not forget that even before uh, you know there was before Musharraf uh, there was the Lahore Declaration so Nawaz Sharif Vajpayee. Then we move on to Musharraf, Musharraf who did Kargil, yet he realized somewhere that no, he had to make, build those bridges. We now have a generation of uh, military commanders who do not, who are much more organic that way, uh, who do not have, I mean, I remember that uh, something which strikes me is that when Musharraf was the army chief was probably the last time, uh, the, the Indian army chief on the other hand was somebody whose family had migrated from Pakistan, what is now Pakistan. So that was the last time that we, we had generals at the top who were from each other's country, right? Now there is lesser interest. There is that disconnect coming. 
Now, the change that has happened in Pakistan, which needs to be understood, which has further been solidified by how Delhi has dealt with, uh, you know, Kashmir issue and, and others, is that Pakistan is saying, no, I'm not going sh to shy away the Pakistani establishment saying, I'm not going to shy away from saying that India is equally responsible for everything bad that's happening. I'm not the only criminal in the room or I'm not the only, uh, you know, person to be to be blamed for 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 all these uh, changes. So there is a new narrative which is setting in. So back channel for just to, to for, for so so for any regime in Islamabad to sell back channel would now be a much harder work than it used to be. And let's suppose now let's suppose and imagine in imaginary that Nawaz Sharif manages to come back. Even for him to restart the dialogue will be a much harder task. He would have come, I mean, the, the geopolitical uh, realities, the, the regional political realities are now also very dependent on your domestic. They have a domestic constituency, they have a domestic audience and they're, they're connected with domestic realities. So if, for example, the opposition uh, you know, and, and by opposition, political opposition, I mean Nawaz Sharif, manages to get back to power. Uh, on the back, there will always be this argument of, I mean, the narrative has been built to the extent when it will become, it will be difficult. Actually, it will be difficult for him to restart the Lahore di the dialogue or uh, the later dialogue. He'd have to be much more cautious, much more careful. I would argue that perhaps there is a need for people, uh, you know, for, for experts, for people who are interested in this India-Pakistan uh, rapprochement or, or, or a more positive relationship to actually think out of the box for how do you, despite this disconnect, how do you keep that interest intact in each other? I mean, today I can live without not going to India. Uh, I can live without being disconnected from India. We've had a period when this was not the case. Now it's different. And now it's connecting with realities. I mean, there, there is terrorism, there is this war. And, and, and the fact is that now there is much less push, external push on, on the region. I mean, I've been talking to people uh, since, uh, you know, American elections, trying to figure out who's going to be doing what uh, in the Biden administration. And the answer that I get from Washington is that, look, listen, um, South Asia is somewhere really low uh, on, on Biden's priority. First, it will be COVID, America domestic, then it will be Europe. South Asia is really down. So despite that there is this China thing, uh, it's also a fact that South Asia is not significant, but which also then means that there will be less pressure on Pakistan and India to have a dialogue to actually look into their existing attitudes and uh, their perspectives and, and do something else. One last point uh, that I would, I would make to what uh, Happy Mon was saying about uh, possibility of, of, of uh, another Balakot. I think what Balakot, Pulwama Balakot uh, taught uh, India and Pakistan, what are we, what we can learn from that is that both countries went away with very different uh, lessons from that conflict. And it is Pakistan's, what Pakistan has learned is not that uh, India could unilaterally take any action that Pakistan, the lesson is that India could take a unilateral action, but then Pakistan could forcefully respond as well. And in fact, if we tie it in with emerging geopolitics, the lesson for Pakistan is that, look, it would be in America's greater interest to uh, actually avoid that kind of uh, a conflict conflict from, from happening, especially if it, if it wants India on its side, if America wants India on its side to fight China. So to contain conflict, 
would be of international interest. And therefore, that's where what Pakistan, one of the lessons that Pakistan has learned through decades of conflict with India, that you raise the stakes uh, regionally in order for international community to come in and, and, and save the moment. Uh, and this time it's not, wouldn't be just saving the moment for the region between South Asia, but also for, uh, you know, global politics. Mm -hmm. oh, right. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the trouble is that, um, you know, earlier on the governments uh, in India and I'm sure in Pakistan, engaged in a certain rhetoric about each other um, for public consumption, right? Uh, and yet they had a certain policy of engaging each other in a uh, particular manner towards conflict resolution, etc. Right? There, there was an underlying desire to uh, go to the negotiating table, discuss outstanding issues, and perhaps, you know, reach a rapprochement. So there was a, there was a, uh, you know, difference between rhetoric and policy. And I think that is changing today. Today, rhetoric is policy. And your policy is informed by your rhetoric. There is, so even though the, a lot of Indians and Pakistanis were not really, you know, uh, happy with each other, the governments knew at some point of time that they had to talk to each other. As Manmohan Singh put it, you can't change your neighbor. That was the underlying belief. That belief is changing today. Today, there is a feeling that you can do without talking to Pakistan. You can do without resolving your outstanding conflict with Pakistan. And I think so there is this, this, this fundamental difference in the Western show in, in, in Pakistan and in India. I think that, again, Aisha, Aisha pointed towards that when she talked about the cultural disconnect, etc. Feeding, feeding to that in some ways. I think that the, the diminishing returns from a certain uh, peace building process uh, to me, to my mind, that is worrying. Uh, having said that, you know, if I were to sort of simulate um, uh, and build a scenario as to sort of how the two sides could potentially get back on the negotiating table, I would say if I were to be uh, a, a decision maker in India, I would say, hey, wait a minute, we have a, you know, so-called two and a half, two and a half front situation today. What do we do about that? I mean, this is, this is, the, this is China on the one hand. It's a huge military power, rising superpower on the one hand in the Eastern Front, and you have Pakistan on the Western Front. We have a situation in Kashmir. So from my national interest point of view, I need to break that up. I need to break that 2.5, uh, 2 half front situation. How do I do that? I do that by way of reaching out to the Kashmiris and pacifying the situation in Kashmir and engaging Pakistan in a back channel conversation. The trouble with that is at this point of time, the decision makers in Delhi uh, um, uh, haven't really reached that conclusion that it is useful to break up that two and a half, two and a half front situation. And that is useful for national interest for several reasons. One, as I said earlier, too much has been invested towards the rhetoric on Kashmir, uh, right? A certain myth building has been done from a military point of view. Every central term, too many sunk costs vis a Kashmir. Uh, so it's not easy to sort of go back from that. And that if you do go back, then there are audience costs, which the government of India is not sort of keen to accept at this point of time, given the kind of, uh, given the nature of the government that is in power. Um, I, 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 and on the other hand, uh, you know, if, when you look at, when the government of India looks at Pakistan, uh, it, it, it gets mixed messages. Um, will it be possible for the government of India to get into a negoti nego negotiation and then sustain that negotiation without any hindrances. Just very briefly, in, in 30 seconds, I'll take you back to 2014 onwards. Um, I would say the, uh, Mr. Modi started out quite well in 2014. He invited Nawaz Sharif for this wearing in ceremony. In 2015, December, he went to uh, Lahore in an in, for an impromptu visit. Um, and even after the Pathan court attack, um, you know, he sort of played it down. In fact, he invited the Pakistan investigation team to come to Pathan court, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, no return invitation was received by India. I think things started changing after the Uri attack in many ways. So it is not as if Mr. Modi did not give it a try uh, from the government of India's point of view. I'm not, I'm not spokesperson. I'm an analyst. I'm trying to understand 
from his point of view, he gave it a try. It didn't work because terrorism continued unabated in his sort of understanding. So for him to sort of, uh, he changed the ones from 2014 to 2016, a path, a certain path was followed. And 2016 to 2020, a different path is followed. Now for him to go back to the 2015, 2014 mood, there has to be, there will have to be assurances that, hey, if you take a certain path and that path will take you somewhere, otherwise it is going to be very difficult for Modi to save his face domestically to get into another conversation, which is either fruitless or counterproductive. Um, so I, I think given the, given the recent accusations and the recent, uh, the recent, recent statements by the Pakistani side, my own feeling is that, and by saying, uh, as, as, as Aisha correctly pointed out, uh, the SAPM on the Pakistani side um, um, said that India reached out for conversations and we said no, which is preempting uh, any potential contact with the Pakistani side, any potential, including uh, a back channel conversation uh, with, with the Pakistanis. Now, to, you, you've got to be very careful while making such statements. Why? Because you are basically saying that even if you come back for a conversation tomorrow, we are not interested. Now that is closing the door. So on the Indian side, uh, there seems to be a certain thinking developing about a dialogue. And on the Pakistani side, they seem to have closed the door. So I think we are we are in dire straits, as it were, uh, as far as the bilateral conversation is concerned. It would take a lot of courage and statesmanship on both sides, even if they were to engage in a back channel conversation. I mean, thank you so much for that, that point. Now, in terms of opening up the flow, what I'll do is I'll we'll take questions in the sets of three, if that's fine by both with both of you, because there are quite a few questions and I want to give as many of our participants a chance to be able to ask their question. What I'll do is I'll read out two questions which are literally listed from the top on the Q&A session. And I'll, once I've listed those questions, I'll invite Professor Gurupal Singh, who's uh, mentioned here, highlighted here as team know-how to spell out, come and speak up his question. So the first question here is by Ramesh Balakrishnan. And uh, he mentioned something what, you know, Happy Man, you just ended your, your point with, is this uh, preempting of a dialogue by, by the SAPM of Pakistan, Moeed Yusuf. Ramesh's question is that he did not, Moeed Yusuf did not entirely rule out dialogue, but he did mention that Pakistan wants India to fulfill two conditions before talks can possibly begin. Of course, reinstatement of Article 370 and removing of restrictions in Jammu and Kashmir. Given that India is unlikely to go back on either of these issues, broadly speaking, can a track two dialogue tackle this thorny problem of how the two sides can step back from the brink? You mentioned, Happy Man, you mentioned that it would take a lot of foresight, uh, uh, you know, kind of strategic foresight and courage uh, among the leadership of both countries to take a process forward. But as someone who is very, who has been intimately involved in the track two processes for many years, do you think that is something that can help? And I. I, I, you know, Aisha mentioned that uh, there were problems, there were issues with that kind of a, that, that kind of track too. What are your thoughts on that? The second question is more directed towards Aisha by Raghav. Uh, and his question is that with Imran Khan resorting to the kind of personal attacks on Modi and the government of India, do you see any scope or feasibility of engagement? And has General Bajwa's tenure extension weaken the edifice of the Pakistani army? A very important question because we often forget that it's not just the civil military relationship, but also the politics of the, the politics within Pakistan security establishment, which is often very consequential. Thank you to Ramesh and Raghav for that, for those very interesting questions. Uh, Professor Gurhar Pal Singh, can I invite you to now spell out your question as well? Thank you so much. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, uh, my question, I'm sorry, uh, it's coming up as team know-how. Um, it's a new computer from Curry, so it's not uh, a university computer. Um, my question is to both, uh, both presenters. It's namely that uh, India and Pakistan are regional powers, um, albeit with um, nuclear weapons and that they only get onto the global scene when they are a nuisance, when they threaten world peace. And so in that sense, um, you know, whatever the cultural uh, similarities and other factors which have been mentioned, it's partly, it's only a, only a crisis will bring them to their senses as it were. So can I ask, um, 
the contributors to reflect on that because I think you know states act in their interests and other factors are largely irrelevant. Thank you so much for that question, Gurupal. Uh, happy with this time, can I request you to take the first tab at the questions? Right. Um, thank you, Avinash. Um, you know, on, on this question that Mr. Krishnan raised um, about, about the two preconditions that uh, uh, Dr. Yusuf uh, put forward in his um, interview with Karan Thapar, uh, I think in my, in my personal opinion as an analyst, and I've known Yusuf, Dr. Yusuf for, for a very long time. Um, I think this is not um, this is not great statecraft. Um, if you do want um, a conversation, if you do want a dialogue with India, um, you don't put out these uh, preconditions publicly. Um, I think that is not useful. These preconditions, if any, have to be conveyed um, through the proper channel in, in a proper uh, manner that states are used to. So I thought, I, so my opinion, therefore, this peace offer was not genuine. This was point scoring at the best, uh, and therefore, uh, not not very not very um, useful. Um, you know the, I you know sometimes people make a um, um, do not make a distinction between back channel dialogue and a track two conversation. Right, a back channel dialogue is. Uh, done by um, representatives appointed by the government. Uh, for example, you had uh, um, Tariq Aziz, Mr. Tariq Aziz on the Pakistani side and Mr. Tatinder Lamba on the Indian side negotiating um, um, on behalf of Manmohan Singh and uh, Musharraf uh, on Kashmir from 2004 to 2008. And, and many others came on board thereafter, um, including Riyaz Mohammad Khan, um, etc. So, they directly report to their prime minister slash president and take inputs from the highest leadership in order to carry on a conversation. And the 2004-2008 conversation actually uh, did lead to a uh, sort of a quasi-agreement in 2007. June, Mr. Dr. Manmohan Singh was supposed to visit Pakistan to sort of agree to a certain understanding on Kashmir. But unfortunately, the lawyer, lawyer's agitation against Mr. Uh, General Musharraf uh, spoiled the uh, spoil the party as it were. So it is not as if back channel conversations cannot uh, achieve anything. Back channel conversations can achieve a lot of things should there be desire uh, on, on both sides to do that. But at this point of time, the question is not about the existence or non-existence of uh, a back channel. Uh, the non-existence of a back channel is indicative of the fact that there is no desire for uh, any rapprochement, any conversation at this point of time. As far as uh, track two is concerned. You know, track two is a very, very different animal altogether. You know, track two is carried out by uh, retired civil servants, as Aisha pointed out, um, some academics, uh, people who are assumed to have a certain traction within the government. The objective is not to be radically different from what the governments believe at a certain point of time, but to sort of feed into the possibility of a um, um, you know, uh, conversation between the two sides, rather than completely opposing the two governments' narrative as it were. So, um, in in many ways, therefore, the um, uh, try to create a certain normative framework, uh, create a certain um, you know environment in in, in each country, um, which would could potentially promote uh, a dialogue between the two sides. It also very importantly, may I say. Uh, track two also sustains the space and constituencies on either side for any future conversation. Uh, with again, as Aisha pointed out, with the cultural disconnect that we have today, if we proceed on this path, there will be nobody left tomorrow in India or Pakistan uh, who are willing to understand each other or talk to each other. And also, this, this also helps in many ways to sort of uh, provide fresh ideas and recommendations to either government uh, as and when they are willing to take on board some of these. Suggestions. I can tell you, for instance, um, some of us have been talking about the line of control of firing for the last five years, and we have, uh, remember, there is no uh, ceasefire agreement between India and Pakistan. It's only a telephone conversation between the two armies. So we have prepared um, uh, several pages of recommendations on how a ceasefire agreement between India and Pakistan should, should look like. Retired army officers on the Indian side and Pakistani, office, uh, Pakistani side, and 
uh, some civilian academics, we've sort of put these things together. When the governments wants to, governments want to sort of take a look at it, they can do that. But coming coming to the uh, second point uh, uh, that Professor Singh made, I'm not so sure I quite get the question. I got his argument, which is India and Pakistan sort of uh, uh, become a uh, matter of discussion in the international community only when they uh, create problems or when there when there is a crisis between the two sides, Kargil, Parliament, Mumbai, etc. Um, I'm not so sure what is the question here, so perhaps I can revisit this question after um, um, Aisha answers this. Yeah. Um, let me try to uh, kind of respond to, uh, to, to Professor Singh's uh, question, and I kind of suspect that, you know, probably I've, I've got what he's, he's trying to say. Uh, yes, unfortunately, it's only in a crisis that India and Pakistan come to international attention. Uh, but uh, there, there is a change which is happening, uh, or uh, this is a change that Delhi assumes is happening. Uh, for the first time, South Asia, which was uh, and 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 in within South Asia, India, which was uh, kind of secondary. Uh, I mean, firstly, South Asia was always secondary uh, for the international community, for the for the Western political world, geopolitical world. Now it's for the first time that India is becoming central to it. So it's uh, to answer the question, it's going beyond crises. Uh, so South Asia. Could, would be looked at during crisis, but from Indian perspective, this is probably the first time that it's beyond the crisis that the world is looking at it. But yes, of course, crisis brings back attention to, to India and Pakistan. Um, and, 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 and as a region, in, in some ways, in a, as a region together, India and Pakistan, uh, and, uh, what has happened in the past, um, a decade, uh, the war on terror, that somehow Pakistan got disjointed from India, debracketed from India by, by Western debate and discussion, and it got bracketed with Afghanistan. So instead of Indo-Pak, what we had, we, were, we have AFPAC, uh, and it has had a, you know, a, it has had a play over thinking of, of uh, international politics on, on, on the region, how the region was kind of uh, thought about. Uh, but I think unfortunately, at, at, at the, it's, it's also a very, um, you know, lack of leadership, limited thinking. I think uh, the one time we've had under Manmohan Singh and, and, and later, later even under uh, Narendra Modi, uh, we, we did, uh, you know, and, and, and Nawaz Sharif on, on Pakistan's side, uh, we did have a leadership which for momentarily thought about rising uh, above the crises and actually resetting the relationship. In Pakistan's case, it was also a paradigm shift, so to speak. Uh, I mean, interestingly, the period that, again, is not that well studied, uh, when needs more attention in Pakistan, is that the third tenure of, of, of Nawaz Sharif, it was for the first time that uh, he was talking about not just CPEC, which is China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which means political economic relations with China, which Pakistan has not had with China before. Uh, Pakistan has had military strategic ties with, with China, but this was uh, political economic ties with China. But at the same time, having a very serious conversation on economy and trade with India. And if that had worked, it would have been a major paradigm shift for Pakistan. Uh, and, and, and so to kind of uh, finish on answering uh, Professor Singh's question, I think there was a moment when we could have, the region could have done beyond crisis, but we are back to the same cycle. Uh, you know, we, we, we are, uh, you know, at, at the best of times, we tend to behave, uh, you know, like uh, Second World War veteran militaries and, and, and uh, post-colonial states who cannot reimagine relationships differently, unfortunately. Going to this, the, 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 the second question that way, um, you know, the second question about Bajwa's extension and all, uh, 
yes, Pakistan is going through this uh, an inner dialogue as well. Uh, I'm not saying that there are guarantees of its success of opposition parties, including PMLN and some ways the PPP and, and JUIF trying to push back. Uh, Bajwa's extension is for me is not the issue here. For me, uh, it is how uh, military leadership is negotiating its internal relationships. I mean, if 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 uh, it's it's almost become like a, 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 a like a habit that every general tends to now ask for an extension. Um, I, I, I and I think this is a serious dialogue Pakistan should have internally. You know, uh, a dialogue with the between the military and the parliament and within the military itself. How long should be the tenure of a, of an army chief? Three years? Five years? What? Instead of running after, instead of hiding behind extensions, extension should be done away with. Um, and, but even with or without extension, I think there is uh, a, a, a powerful uh, narrative that the military has, which has become further strengthened with Article 370 on the one hand, and the other, uh, you know, uh, the whole new narrative that is now will now emerge from Pakistan that India is engaged in serious terrorism in Pakistan. Uh, so irrespective of who gets an extension or not, this will be the new narrative and that's how it should be seen. Um, the, 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 the question on very brief comment on, on, on the first question about 317, what Muid Yusuf was, was trying to do. Um, and the point is that, uh, you know, even I think I, where I think I didn't agree with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Yusuf's uh, strategy uh, or tactic uh, at all was that, you know, there are times when countries need back channel and they seriously need back channel for their own benefit, not for the other. Forget about India, Pakistan peace. Uh, they need it for themselves. And to actually put conversation of that back channel in the public uh, domain uh, is, I think, was not being fair to Pakistan itself. Pakistan might need that back channel for its own purpose. And therefore, uh, that's why I think it was scuttling a dialogue, not starting a dialogue. Uh, putting conditionalities is is uh, is is another uh, whole problem in itself, and and so, and I think what the 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 problem with the track two and and there I would kind of uh, you know I hope Happy Mon uh, doesn't kind of uh, mind it, but I think that's where I have an issue with track two. Uh, track two was theoretically is not meant to be track one or an extension of track one. Uh, We've had experience of track to, uh, you know, in the Middle East, uh, you know, Palestinians uh, with Israelis, um, and you know, it has it, happened with with Egypt and Israel, many other places where where track twos have happened. Now, track twos are meant to be glued into uh, into the conversation of track one. They can. They, they're, you know, they're, they're supposed to listen to what track one is saying, but they have to be independent of track, of track one. In India, Pakistan's case, track two has been really uh, replicating, they've been replicating track one. And therefore, uh, so what we have is, I mean, I've seen, uh, and, and this was a study which was done, Ford Foundation initially, United States, um, they financed the track two, and then they did an audit of the track two. And they figured out that it was actually not being useful. And I think uh, British FCO and others need to really think how track tools uh, in case of Indian Pakistan to finance by, by the FCO, how they are actually uh, doing, what are they, what, what benefits are they providing? Are they giving new ideas at all? Uh, and I think it's very important. And, and, and I think for me, the biggest failure is that whenever there is a crisis between India and Pakistan, those stakeholders that are track two who shouldn't be part of the track one exactly behave, begin to behave like track one. Uh, you know, there's no condemnation, there's no uh, statement, there's nothing to kind of give one hope that track two is thinking uh, very further away from, from uh, track two is thinking further away from track.
track one. So perhaps a different set of dialogue needs to be sought out. Uh, people are engaged. I mean, people, uh, India and Pakistan will remain relevant despite the different, for each other, despite different narratives. And I think this is a moment when no dialogue seems possible, that something needs to be dug out. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Hathiman. Uh, what I'll do now is uh, we have 15 odd minutes left. I'll take some questions also from Facebook Live that are coming in, and then I'll invite one of the uh, participants who's raised his hand, Tarun Upadhyay. So there are, there are two broad categories of these questions. I'm clubbing them together. You know, The first is more against continuing on the element of the domestic and the structural by Khizr Asad, who mentions that there's a recurring historical phenomenon where political polarization happens during uh, times of economic hardship. Do you think that this kind of economic hardship plays some role in determining how governments uh, in India and Pakistan deal with each other? I mean, this is a larger kind of theory of kind of, you know, uh, deflecting attention from issues that are central to the well-being and the development of these countries. Do you think this, do you buy into this argument of deflection at a moment of economic crisis? crisis? And similarly, there's a question by Javaria Seher from Facebook Live who says, in that situation, I mean, does a change in leadership really matter? Would the narrative really change tomorrow if we are assuming suddenly Nawaz Sharif is back and there is a non-BJP government in Delhi? Some really important questions, structural in, in nature. There's a question which takes us away from the domestic aspect by Akib Javid, uh, is on the issue of, and this question is directed towards Hapiman, is uh, on the current Sino-Indian crisis. And Hapiman, again, this is, I, I find it very interesting. You mentioned in your presentation that Kashmir has no locus standi on the issue of the revocation of Article 317 in India. It's a domestic issue, and I appreciate where you're coming from and on that issue, but as is often the case with issues which are conflicted or contested, right? Uh, the implications may not necessarily be domestic as is the case in this. And it's not just the reaction that we are seeing from Pakistan uh, to India's move, but also according to many China specialists as well, from what I've been reading, there is some degree of, uh, you know, there's some metal in, in, in this argument that the decision on Article 370 featured into Chinese calculus on the kind of operations they did earlier this, this year in Eastern Lutak. So how do you tackle these issues? And do you think the, the entry of China, I mean, you have addressed this partly in your presentation, has really kind of fundamentally altered the calculus for New Delhi. And that's perhaps one reason why Delhi is not even willing, as you mentioned earlier, to recognize the fact that talking to Pakistan may be an option because it's so polarized. These are the two broad questions on the domestic aspects. And, China. Tarun, if I may request you now to kind of spell your question out, please. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Tarun. We can hear uh, you. Can I ask a question? Yes, and please introduce yourself as well, if you can. Hi, I'm Tarun Upadhyay. I'm a contributor for Outlook India, and I was earlier working with Hindustan Times. I'm based in Jammu. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Can I ask a question to Aisha? Aisha, my question is that uh, what I personal, what I believe is that uh, revocation of Article 370 is a new reality in India. And Indian establishment be, believes that this new reality has to be a starting point with Pakistan. If this is being accepted in Pakistan, and secondly, if this anti-Muslim uh, atmosphere which is prevailing in India, if, if it tempers down, can that also temper down the hostility between India and Pakistan? And the two countries can start working out at least to have a certain a semblance of dialogue. And secondly, uh, and I want to ask Aisha that uh, the Pakistan military establishment, I believe, is still set, uh, is still in a feudal mindset. So to accept the democratization of Pakistan itself and the dialogue, which is a manifestation of democratization, also. Can they accept these two realities? Thank you, Tarun, for your questions. I shall request you to come in first in this round of questions, and both to Aisha and Happyman, given the time constraints that we had, and in the interest of having at least one more round of 
of questions. Could I request you to both to be as concise as possibly can? I know the the, the difficulty of that given the, the, the breadth and depth of the questions, but please, Aisha, the floor is yours. Right. The first question on on uh, on the economy and, and whether uh, you know that's that's uh, to deflect from the economic reality. I would argue that uh, you know there are tactical benefits and 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 uh, of uh, you know of 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 this conflict uh, deflecting attention from uh, what the economy how the economy is doing uh, that's just one. But despite having that uh, and 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 conversely one could argue that when india was doing well uh, economically uh, there was also a dialogue there was propensity you know manmohan singh government congress government uh, which wanted to have a dialogue uh, yet uh, i don't think that this is a factor which is which stands alone in dictating uh, you know the, the the course of of india pakistan relations or whether it's going to be uh seen in in very conflictual terms or, or peace terms so it's independent it's 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 kind of related it's it's cause and effect uh it's it's more of effect than than a cause in itself uh to Tarun's questions about uh 370 um uh, I think we have just started with 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 370, and at at this point in time, the strategy, Pakistan strategy, would be to push to that extent where uh, India realizes the cost. Now, traditionally, how India's cost was raised was through militancy, allowing militants to cross over, uh, you know, allowing for uh, you know war war to come come to India, and in fact. Uh, you know, one of the militant organizations, Jesh Mohammed, had recently been talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, this being there's there being a landmine, uh, you know, uh, uh, in in um, movement, the Kashmir movement being a landmine buried underneath, which will suddenly blow up, uh, and in fact, uh, this is this is this is the uh, this is the parameter through which. Islamabad continues to think that 370 will certainly blow up in, in, in uh, India's face and India will have to kind of not settle down with 370. Now the parallel, uh, so, so, so one, Pakistan is not accepted it, it, it is yet, maybe at a later stage, what will happen? What will there be series of crises before we come to that? That's one question. The other is that uh, will reduction of anti-Muslim rhetoric I think the two issues are independent. Firstly, I think a question, a counter question that I would want to ask is that is, for example, BJP uh, capable of, of delinking the two? Uh, uh, right now, there is peace in, there is relative peace in, in Kashmir through different means, through force, coercion, whatever, whatever. Uh, but, but, you know, shots are not being fired. But and and then there is also the the anti-Muslim rhetoric in India. Now let's imagine if if uh, there is cooling down on one, or if uh, you know the the situation improves. But if 370 doesn't change, uh, I don't think that these are two independent matters that get get connected as well. And I don't think that Pakistan would go uh, is is willing to go beyond that. Thank you, Aisha. Happy. Thanks. Uh, very quickly, I think, again, I agree with uh, Aisha's argument uh, about, um, you know, whether it is a deflection or a diversionary tactic from the economic realities. I, I think this is not a, a you know, uni a causal, um, uh, you know, phenomena, as it were. I think there are, there are several things that sort of feed into uh, why there is this, um, um, you know, standoff between India and Pakistan on the question of Kashmir. There, 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 are, there are the historical realities that there is the rhetoric that either both sides have sort of built over the years that have come back to sort of bite uh, uh, them in the back. There is, of course, the electoral angle to it in India, certainly. Um, and for, for Pakistan, uh, perhaps its army um, uh, gains a lot of legitimacy by upping the ante in Kashmir. Um, and clearly there is um there there is there is the utility in um, diverting attention from uh, domestic economic and other realities uh, i think i think it would be wrong to sort of uh, give it a um, 
you know, a monocausal um, explanation as it were. I think there are there are multiple uh, f um, aspects to uh, the this this particular issue. What I thought, I think this was a, this is an important question: whether um, a change in government uh, uh, make a difference um, to India's Pakistan policy and and vice versa. Let me sort of talk about. Uh, uh, how I see as far as the Indian side is concerned. I think it's a big yes and a small no. Uh, the big yes, because I think if the Congress party or a non-BJP government is in power in Delhi tomorrow, their uh, desire to reach out to Pakistan and have a rapport with Pakistan will be far more than uh, what currently exists in Delhi, number one. Number two, even vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir, I think uh, the no, small no, because I don't think these, the withdrawal of the special status is going to be reinstated, even if um, uh, there is going to be a new uh, non-BJP government at some point of time in future. Even under the Congress government, it will be difficult for the Congress government to return the uh, uh, special status, but a lot of other things can happen vis-a-vis Kashmir and vis-a-vis Pakistan. So I think governments and the men and women who are in government do make a difference when it comes to bilateral relations and foreign policies of states. Um, Kashmir is, I, I, I made the argument that Kashmir, uh, what happened in Kashmir in 2019 August is a, uh, a domestic um, uh, development. Yes, it was meant to be a domestic development, but sometimes, um, you know, sometimes your rhetoric um, uh, creates a lot of problems, right? For example, the Indian rhetoric at that point of time about uh, Aksai Chin also belongs to um, the Jammu and Kashmir and that, 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 that belongs to us may have ruffled the feathers in, in, in Beijing. And that may have, I have argued in my uh, writings earlier on, that may have actually prompted, prompted to some extent the Chinese reaction on the line of access control. So it, when I say it is a domestic development, what I'm simply trying to say is that, uh, hey, wait a minute, whatever India has done vis-a-vis -vis Jammu and Kashmir, um, a lot of the same has been done by the Pakistanis on the question of uh, uh, POK or uh, uh, Gilgit Baltistan. So, um, you know, so this is not really something that uh, deserved this kind of attention, except for the fact that a lot of things that happened inside the valley perhaps required a certain amount of attention from um, uh, well-meaning people within, within India. Um, and if uh, people desire outside India, so be the case. But the Pakistani state making a big issue out of the constitutional changes in Kashmir, I think that was perhaps unnecessary. I'll just Take 30 seconds uh, to, to, to uh, come back on the issue of uh, track two, uh, simply because I run one of the uh, track twos in South Asia um, on the Indian side, the Chao Phraya dialogue. Uh, you know, one, sometimes, and I, I would say that the, uh, these dialogues do not uh, uh, represent uh, government opinions beyond their points. Now, let me put it this way. Sometimes the funders come back and ask us, wait a minute, you have you don't have enough traction within the government so sometimes it is the objective of these dialogues to have that traction within the government for what in order to in order to channel suggestions recommendations shape help shape policy etc to do that you cannot be uh, a, a completely um, uh, you cannot be completely divorced of how the government views or both the government's view uh, the realities on the ground sometimes you go to uh, work with them in order to change their policies. Number one. Number two, uh, people come back and come, come and ask sometimes, wait a minute, you have been running these tractors for so many years. What have you achieved? I say, wait a minute, the governments have been talking to each other for so many years. What have they achieved? Uh, right? So it is not possible for tractors to make policy changes when governments simply refuse to make those policy changes. We can only aid and abet and recommend, right? Uh, and, and, and thirdly, if you shut down these, these minimal contacts that exist today uh, in, the, in the track two forums, uh, what contacts will you end up having at the end of the day? Uh, you don't have track one, you don't have track 1.5, you shut track, track two, what will, you be, what will you be left with? Nothing. I think that would be a mistake to, mistake to uh, therefore that would be a mistake. I think, I think sort of, I leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Abhiman. Thank you, Aisha. One last round of questions. I am very... One, one, one... Avinash. Okay, please. Okay, very quick. Avinash, just, just, just one second. Uh, just very quickly, I think on, on India-Pakistan peace, I think, and, and its connection with, with China, I think at this point in time when, uh, you know, the temperature is heating up between China and India, I think that in itself makes it very difficult for Pakistan. 
to, to detract itself and to say that I'm going to go and have this dialogue and have this peace talk with, with India, that even dampens down the possibility. Uh, and very quickly uh, to Happy Mon, I think I'm not against track two. What I'm saying is that probably there is a need for a different kind of a conversation. Thank you, Aisha. Last round very quickly. And let me, before I open, I mean, before I said, spell the questions out, apologies to some of the participants. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to take all questions. Some of the questions are very fascinating, very important. But given that we have covered quite a lot of ground, I'll focus on some of the questions, which I think might help us expand this, this, this conversation. There are questions, especially on the recent elections in Gilgit Baltistan from Anvesha Ray, who's joined us through Facebook Live from ST Raza. But I think partly that has been covered uh, you know, by Hapman. Uh, if you want to take it, please, you know, either of you feel free to take that. Uh, how does the change, how does that, these elections change the narrative for a settlement? But then there are questions. There's a question by Ronak Bhattacharji uh, on the issue of, you know, it's a very military studies, defense studies related question on the issue of the scope for interoperability between the PLA and the Pakistani army of the Pakistani military. Now, historically, a military which has been more gravitating towards the West in terms of at least its weaponry and only recently has opened up its arms and ammunition to, to kind of Chinese stockpiles. Do you think there are doctrinal and cultural challenges in that kind of interoperability, especially given the situation that we see on the LSE and LOC? Uh, Harriman, please feel free to come on that one as well. And one last question, perhaps, uh, this is, you know, by Barzain Vadmar, who's at SOAS, and is also echoed to some extent by uh, participant Shubham. You mentioned, Aisha, that Pakistan is adopting sort of a European style liberal Islam, ALA Turkey, right? According to Barzain, if anything, Erdogan is Turkey's Modi. So how, what, what exactly do you mean by that? And how is it that the different kind of Islamism that you spoke about, how is it different from the other strains of Islamic kind of thought and Islamist practices perhaps. Uh, is, is, is that kind of thing coming from Pakistan different really? Or is it we are talking more of the same in a different context? Thank you so much for all these very important questions. I'll, in this case now, I think I asked Aisha to step in first earlier. Uh, I'll ask, I'll request Happyman to take, take this tab. And thank you so much Happyman, the floor is all yours. Uh, thanks, Avinash. I am not going to speak much. It's already uh, uh, 90 minutes. So what I will basically do is that address this question about the interoperability, but I'm sure Aisha is going to come in on that. What I just want to say is that I think it's going to be not so easy for that interoperability to sort of kick in, um, um, except, if, uh, 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 you know, the Indian fear really is not about the Pakistan army and the Chinese army operating um, um, together um, simultaneously in a two-front war with India. I think that's overstated. Um, the, the, I think the concern in many ways is the intelligence sharing or satellite um, imagery, the sharing of satellite intelligence, um, uh, etc. So, um, I, I mean, sitting in Delhi, I don't think the worry is uh, really about the increasing interoperability between China, Chinese army and the Pakistan army. Uh, which, in my uh, understanding, um, you know, it, there, there needs to be a lot more improvement if that were to come to fruition. On the other hand, we have a lot more, uh, I would say, interoperability between the um, Indians and the, and the United States, for example, with all the uh, new um, agreements that are being signed. Um, but I think Aisha will be able to throw more light on the, uh, the, the ground level interoperability between the two armies. I leave it at that. Thank you, Abhinav. Sure. Right. Very quickly. Uh, firstly, with Gilgit Baltistan. Right. Firstly, with Gilgit Baltistan elections, uh, there's nothing new about the Gilgit Baltistan recent Gilgit Baltistan elections. What we've learned from these elections is one: whoever makes the government in Islamabad tends to go and win the elections in, in GB. Uh, earlier on, it was the PPP. Now, then. Uh, now, now it's PTI, which, which has, uh, and, and they're more independents. More independent candidates have also won, which means that they can go either way, which means that PTI will probably get to make, make the government. Um, at best, it has impact on how um, Pakistani politics will be conducted. Now, but the underlying thing which has been happening is that military has been asking, uh, it has had 
separate conversations with all political parties to make them to agree to special uh, to giving GB uh, the status of an independent province, fifth province of Pakistan. That is huge. That's that's big. Uh, now, what Pakistan is of course going to argue is that it's not. It has been forced. Its hand has been forced by Indian action in, in Kashmir. That. It's not the one which is violating uh, the UN resolution that it's India and it has to do because of it had to make GB a separate province because of the wishes of, of the people. Um, the, the matter is unresolved. I think the, 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 the story of GB goes back even further. I mean, it was during 1974. I mean, look, what, 70, what did Article 370 do? Uh, 370 do in India? It kind of uh, it kind of uh, brought a shift in in, in the whole, the issue of state Kashmiri as a, Kashmiris as state subjects. So Kashmir, the Indian part of Kashmir was part of Indian Kashmir. Yet they were independent. They were state subjects. They were subjects of the state of Kashmir. So that status had had continued. The same goes for, goes for the Pakistani side because this was an unresolved dispute. Therefore. Kashmiris had the independent status. India changed it with three, Article 370. Pakistan changed it for Gilgit Baltistan somewhere in the 1970s. So Gilgit Baltistan, the ID card, the national ID card, everybody in Pakistan has a national ID card. The ID card for Kashmiris says a uh, citizen of uh, Azad Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, now that is called state subject, being a state subject. Gilgit Baltistan, which is part of the larger uh, Kashmir, uh, state of Jammu Kashmir, also had that status until I believe 1974. That was changed then. So this status, the state subject status, which the government of Pakistan had given to GB was then suspended for Gilgit Baltistan. Uh, it's interesting that India never talked about it, but. For GB, this had already been suspended in the 1970s. So what the government of Pakistan will probably do by making GB a separate province. So what we see here is Indian, Indian side, Pakistani side seems to be kind of drifting towards uh, a kind of solution, so to speak, lack of better word of, of Kashmir independently. Instead of sitting on a table, they're independently making moves which actually, I mean, I've been talking to some Kashmiris from the Pakistani side, we're Kashmiri nationalists. And they, for the first time, have said, look, we recognize that Kashmir issue is pretty much dead. Uh, the way, not just India, where India is going, but also where Pakistan is going. Uh, I mean, GB has a huge impact. Now, uh, the second question on PLA and, and Pakistan military. Pakistan military, Pakistan army had been shifting towards uh, 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 Chinese weaponry much more since the 1990s. But now, for the first time, you have Pakistan Navy and the Pakistan Air Force, which are also shifting towards China. And there's much, there, there are far more uh, military officers who are now going to China for different training. Um, yet, I think what is important is, yes, there will be, uh, but, but then, the, the, they are training in each other's ways. There is interoperability. They're, they're learning uh, about each other, use of weapons, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I don't think that we will come to a point where Pakistan allows, Pakistan sees the risk of, also understands the risk of interoperability with a bigger power like China. Uh, and, and therefore, I think it's going to be much more cautious. Uh, it would want to do things on its own, seek help, uh, um, military hardware, etc., um, but not, uh, you know, uh, interoperability, man-to-man -man, uh, engagement. That that's that's not. I I don't think that's a, a short term or a short to medium term possibility. Now about liberal Islam, and, and, and I know that was a naughty statement I made, um, and, and my intention was to kind of provoke a, a conversation. Now what I meant was that Pakistan's Islamism is different from the Islamism that you've seen in Saudi Arabia or, or other parts. Uh, 
Pakistan Islamism is can be both liberal and conservative at the same time. Uh, it's 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 that way that independent model which has pragmatism sewn into it. Uh, so it will, for example, recognize at times that it will recognize, uh, you know, the, the significance of Sharia, yet it would also be able to push back Sharia where it wants to. Uh, and, and for me, this pragmatic, and, 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 and it was, it, you know, it was a very quick, it was uh, lack of a better word, but th and, and that's why I said, you know, it's a more liberal Islamism that way, because, there are portions of liberalism that Pakistan uh, can kind of uh, can can offer uh, or has offered. Uh, it's 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 a mix and match, uh, and I and I realize that the whole discussion on Islamism, uh, how does it compare with different Islamisms? One final point. I mean, it 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 needs a session in itself, so I won't get into the details of it. But one final point that I want to make is that. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, Pakistan's Islamism is very different from, for example, Saudi Islamism. Uh, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia can think of, I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy for it as well, despite what uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, uh, you know, Prince MBS is, is, is doing, uh, the changes he's bringing, A, he can imagine those changes, yet uh, his changes kind of uh, hide uh, the resentment and and the pushback that 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 is uh, and and so you know it's, it's it's a complex model in itself Saudi Arabia but with Pakistan uh, MBS is different. One minor point that I want to uh, draw attention towards is MBS can bring that about the change because MBS can always draw on the Arab nationalism. There is Arabism that uh, 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 as an as a a, a ethnic category that he can depend on. Pakistan cannot depend on any ethnic category. For Pakistan, Islam is this ethnicity. So it has to fill the canvas with different colors, which includes bits of conservatism, bits of liberalism. And that's what I meant that it's a, it's a, it's a different model. Uh, and, you know, someday uh, uh, post COVID, we can sit down and, and chat about it. Absolutely. Uh, Aisha Siddiqa, Dr. Aisha Siddiqa, Dr. Happy Man Jacob, thank you so, so much for taking the time out and really kind of unpacking uh, this issue of India-Pakistan bilateral relations from you know, in a very 360 degree perspective, both from a domestic, uh, from a bilateral, but also from a global perspective and, and also discussing the structures, domestic structures of economy and politi politics in both the countries. I'm sure that uh, our audiences certainly, I, I for sure, have learned a lot and have a lot to kind of think about and take away. Uh, I would also like to thank all our audiences uh, to, for joining us this afternoon. This was the second, we have one more webinar coming, a, coming uh, up on what is the other kind of hot uh, boundary issue in, in the region. And that's the China-India boundary issue that has escalated over the past few months. Uh, of course, it's a long-standing issue, but has really kind of taken a dimension of its own. We'll be discussing that in early December. So please, please, you know, join our emailing lists, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and keep, uh, you know, keep engaging with us. The questions today were really, really helpful, uh, really thought-provoking questions. So thank you for that. And on that note, I would like to wish you all a very good evening and looking forward to seeing you again for the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Avinash. Thank you. Thank you.